Hey everybody, it's Steve here, and today I'm back on a topic that I didn't think I had much more to say, since I spent literally about two hours talking about it before, and apparently a lot of you seem to like it. I was pretty happy continuing with the three other projects I'm working for at the moment, but it seems the topic of new passenger rail services in the US is not a done and dusted affair after all. Last month, the Federal Railroad Administration added on to the routes that are formerly under consideration for the Corridor ID project for future Amtrak and passenger rail services in general by revealing this map, showing their vision for future long-distance overnight train services. And just like the Corridor ID map, this one has drummed up a lot of attention. Though unlike the Corridor ID map and the FRA grants back in December, these are just the proposed routes and the studies as of their feasibility and laying the groundwork to getting them going. But I definitely wanted to talk about this for multiple reasons. For one thing, well, more trains are generally good in my view, especially in a country like the US that used to have lots and lots and lots of trains, got rid of most of them, and are slowly realizing, hey, wait, train good after all. But long distance and overnight routes in particular have always been something of a contentious topic that tends to polarize rail discussion. On the one hand, you have the people who hate that Amtrak is saddled with the long distance services, since they're the main reason why Amtrak is still a loss making entity today, as well as those who generally get annoyed by the blatant delays from freight trains that the vast majority of them suffer from. On the other hand, you have a few distinct types of people that support these routes. You have the history nuts who love the blast from the past aspect and the historical legacy that the trains carry on from their predecessors from the golden age of rail. You get the people who love the trains for how good the onboard services are, with some of the best food you will ever have on any mode of transportation, that is a hill I will die on, and the fact that you can actually get a comfortable sleep on the train. And those who love the spectacular views that the routes are blessed with, that in a lot of places you either can't see any other way, or it's made clear that by taking the train, especially in Amtrak signature sightseer lounge observation cars, you're taking the best way to experience them. But a slowly growing portion of these supporters are those who support the trains from a practical standpoint, and the fact that these routes, however infrequent they may be, serve as vital lifelines to many smaller and medium-sized communities across the country, linking them to other towns and major regional centers. If you're one of those who booked a room for your long distance trip, you may notice that the coach cars further along the train are usually taken by people from more rural places going to faraway places for cheaper prices than booking a room, which, ah, uh, yikes, that can be a bit pricey. So yeah, long distance trains have their proponents and their detractors, of which I consider myself to be one of the former, since not only do I love the long distance routes, having ridden several of them myself, namely the California Zephyr, Southwest Chief, and Capital Limited, but I can see incredible potential in the coming years with various improvements to service reach, service reliability, and hopefully opportunities to be exploited with new equipment, which I'll go into later. So yeah, consider this an analysis of the various routes and what I think Amtrak and the FRA should consider to truly take the long distance services to the next level, and make them a mode of transport for more people than just tourists and those who depend on it for inner city travel. And for those routes that are on the table, some of them are the return of old classics, and others are very much new ideas, some of which seem… confusing to say the least. However, the ones that look like the odd choices seem to me to have some method to the madness, as does this whole project in general, frankly. But first, I'll start with some of the classics, starting off with the only new long distance route that was actually in the Corridor ID proposal for a revival. Alongside proposals to bring two routes, that being the Cardinal between New York and Chicago via Washington DC, West Virginia, Cincinnati, and Indianapolis, and the Sunset Limited between Los Angeles and New Orleans from tri-weekly to daily service, definitely a very good move by the way, which makes them more predictable and dependable, there was also an actual long distance route that was added to the Corridor ID project. And that was a proposed revival of a long lost Amtrak route, the North Coast Hiawatha between Chicago, Milwaukee, the Twin Cities out to Portland and Seattle. Now, of course, those seeing it for the first time may be confused, since it serves the same major cities that the already existing Empire Builder service runs. 
However, the devil very much lies in the details here, namely the cities between the big cities. The Empire Builder runs along the rough route of its old namesake from the Great Northern Railway, which runs to the far north of both North Dakota and Montana before continuing through the northern tip of Idaho and onto Washington State and Oregon. Because of that, besides serving smaller northern communities and passing through Glacier National Park, the Empire Builder's route doesn't serve as many people as this route would, particularly in Montana, which is where the big push to revive the service is coming from. The story of the North Coast Hiawatha is that it's something of a combination of two trains, namely the Northern Pacific Railroad's North Coast Limited and the Olympian Hiawatha from the Milwaukee Road. This route, as the map shows, runs further south after Fargo, North Dakota, passing through Bismarck and then through southern Montana, where it serves several of the state's major cities, including the largest city in the state, Billings, and the state capital of Helena, before heading north to rejoin the Empire Builders route out to the west coast. As I mentioned in my last video, the big push to get this service running again is being led by a group in Montana called the Big Sky Passenger Rail Authority who seems to have done a pretty good job getting the message out there. Of all the proposals that have been put out, this one is easily the one with the biggest hype train that I've seen so far, pun possibly intended, and I definitely want it to succeed, particularly since a successful service here can open the possibility for other routes, one of which I will talk about here, as well as one idea I had just a floating around in my mind, which I must stress is solely my idea at this point, and that's a corridor service running between Helena and Billings, and maybe even Bismarck if they're interested. It could be a nice little augmentation to the North Coast Hiawatha and provide a lot more travel opportunities, as well as hopefully providing a nice little example of rail service working well in areas that are not the obvious suspects. All told, I'm rooting for Big Sky Country here, and I hope that this plays out in getting us another spectacular route through the North. Sticking around the West, we find the proposed revival of another long-lost Amtrak route, that being the Pioneer, which was essentially Amtrak's revival of Union Pacific's City of Portland Streamliner, which was rerouted and extended somewhat when Amtrak revived it as the Pioneer to run between Chicago and Seattle via Denver, Salt Lake City, and Boise, Idaho, before running to Portland and Seattle before its last run in 1997. This version, however, wouldn't go as far as Chicago, though, with this revival seeing service run between Seattle and Denver via Portland, Boise, and Pocatello, Idaho, and Salt Lake City. Regardless, the route of the Pioneer has been one that's been a long-time wish of rail advocates, as not only would it augment the California Zephyr between Denver and Salt Lake City, and the Cascades and Coast Starlight on the Portland to Seattle corridor, but most importantly, it would serve the major cities of Idaho and the more rural communities in western Idaho and eastern Oregon. As a matter of fact, this route was apparently supposed to be looked at as part of the Corridor ID study, but it wouldn't be on the study for one of the most embarrassing reasons imaginable. It turned out that the FRA never got Idaho's submission in the first place because the submission was sent to the wrong link by a staffer. Oops. And it's sad too, because Idaho's DOT seemed to be fairly confident behind closed doors that it would be accepted into the program. And there were definitely fears that the whole concept would be derailed by this, no pun intended. However, the FRA seemed to either have the root on their list themselves, or they took sympathy with the error and added the Pioneer to their long distance wish list. It may not be the full corridor service between Boise and Salt Lake City with multiple daily round trips that I wanted to see, but it's still keeping the dream alive and perhaps serve as the bedrock for a future corridor to come. Yet another one I have no question could be a worthy route to return from the dusty books of history. Just be careful where you send your submissions to next time, please. And a similar return to the Pioneer is the proposed return of another route in the same neighborhood, the proposed return of the Desert Wind. The Desert Wind was once again a revival of a long-lost Union Pacific long-distance route, perhaps most directly, the city of Los Angeles, which directly competed against the legendary Santa Fe Super Chief on the Chicago to LA run. But instead, this route served stops in Cheyenne, Wyoming, Salt Lake City, and Las Vegas before arriving in the LA Basin. The Desert Wind ran along the same basic route from 1979 to 1997, being discontinued a few days after the aforementioned Pioneer was removed from the timetable, and has been missed by aficionados ever since. 
particularly providing rail service in Wyoming, Utah, and Nevada, serving a critical connection particularly between Salt Lake City and Las Vegas. This proposal seeks to revive the desert wind, though again instead of starting in Chicago, the line would start in Denver instead, and then run north to serve Cheyenne, Wyoming to supplement the proposed Front Range Corridor I talked about in the Corridor ID video, before running across Wyoming to Ogden and Salt Lake City, Utah, before heading southwest to Las Vegas and LA. This one is another obvious one to revive since, again, a lot of places in Nevada, including Vegas, have been missing proper rail connections for decades at this point, the future completion of Brightline West notwithstanding, as well as Utah and especially Wyoming, which as I mentioned in my last video, is one of two states in the contiguous US that do not have any passenger rail service at all. Don't worry though, not only is the Equality State getting love in droves from this study, as well as a possible love from the Corridor ID study in the form of the Front Range Corridor, but the other remaining states with no passenger rail service are also going to get some love from this plan. In any case, the Desert Wind is another obvious route to revive, and even if it's not going all the way to Chicago, I'd argue it doesn't really need to, since something that this and the revival of the Pioneer have going for them is that the distances make them much more competitive as sleeper train options for people who are not just sightseeing or taking it out of necessity. The shorter route could allow it to be a one-night trip, with the possibility of a passenger leaving Denver or LA around dinner time, having a meal and chatting with passengers in the lounge, heading off to bed, and then arriving at the end station just after breakfast. Now, I have no doubt that track, signal, and equipment upgrades would be necessary to make that a reality, but the point still remains that it is possible, even with the vast empty distances. It's similar in a lot of ways to how night trains in Europe are working and seeing a big time revival, and there's more things I think we can take from overseas that I'll discuss later. Now, there's also a reasonable argument for a day service as well to focus more on the intermediate stops, but that's another thing too. Nobody said that a long distance train service had to be just once a day in each direction. It could very easily be two, a day train and a night train, for instance, on a 12 hour frequency one serving those traveling between major cities overnight, and another that caters more for sightseers and people in the intermediate cities and towns. That's one thing I can see in terms of potential that American's passenger rail network has, not only the destinations that it serves, but how it can serve them. It will take commitment, yes, but if the people in charge are nudged in the right direction by public discourse and perhaps even a chat with them directly in some cases, I can see a hopeful future for American passenger rail yet and that trend will continue with more of the routes to discuss. So, on to the next one, and it's yet another old Amtrak revival. This time, it's the return of the Floridian between Chicago and Miami, stopping in Indianapolis, Louisville, Nashville, Chattanooga, and Atlanta before reaching Florida, which is a different stopping pattern than the old Amtrak service which went through Alabama, but the same basic idea applies here. The route was originally an amalgamation and consolidation of several routes from competing railroads on the Chicago to Florida run, which naturally was really popular for vacationers, including the Illinois Central City of Miami, the Florida East Coast Dixie Flagler, and the Floridian's most direct descendant, the Pennsylvania Railroad's South Wind, all of which relied on other railroads like the Louisville and Nashville and the Atlantic Coastline to run their trains beyond their territory, which was pretty common for the time. Unfortunately, throughout its life as an Amtrak service, the Floridian was infamous for its poor on-time performance, particularly since it ran on the former Monon Railroad, then Louisville and Nashville line between Indianapolis and Louisville that was horrendously maintained and slow, compounded further by their use of the troublesome SDP-40F diesel locomotives to run their services, which had a nasty habit of derailing on rough track, even at low speeds. Check out this video by Amtrak Guy365 in his Engines of Amtrak series for more on that story. It did host the ill-timed second route of the Auto Train Corporation services to Florida as far as Louisville, but even that didn't go particularly well for them. And despite the great potential of the route, the track conditions and the uncooperative nature of the freight railroads at the time sealed its fate, and it was axed in 1979 after only 8 years. So, I think that the Floridian was one of those routes that had all the potential in the world to be a fantastic service. A night train between the Midwest and Florida is going to be a popular proposition, especially if the speed and timekeeping are brought up to anything close to resembling a decent standard. 
And since a lot of the route seems to be CSX territory, it may not be world beating, but it's got a better chance of being decent than a certain other freight rail operator I can name in the east of the country. On top of that, if the line runs along the route between Nashville, Chattanooga, and Atlanta, it would serve as a great long distance augmentation to the proposed Corridor ID route along the same route and out to Memphis, providing plenty of long distance connections to the Midwest and south of Florida. So if everything plays out the way we hope, this could be a fantastic piece of the puzzle to bring great rail service back to the southeast. And like the rest of the lines, it can be a great way to gradually bring back rail services to states and regions that have missed out on them for a while and are more apprehensive about making the investments to expand services. Again, something I'll expand more upon later. And rounding out the return of the old classics, I want to cap it off with this one, since it seems to be a mix of an old classic and a bit of something new, since it takes a former Amtrak service and extends it further. This is the route between New York City and Dallas-Fort Worth, which mostly follows the route of what was Amtrak's National Limited, which in itself was an amalgamation of its namesake train from the Baltimore and Ohio, as well as the Pennsylvania Railroad, later Penn Central's Spirit of St. Louis. True to its name, the National Limited ran out of New York City, with some coaches starting in Washington, D.C. The two sections of the train would couple together in Philadelphia, or Harrisburg depending on the year, and run out to St. Louis, stopping in Pittsburgh, Columbus, Dayton, and Indianapolis to St. Louis. When Amtrak took over the spirit of St. Louis and renamed it the National Limited, they extended the route to Kansas City. But despite increased ridership and political support from the state governments in Illinois and Missouri, the train was sadly axed as part of a federal budget cut to Amtrak and falling beneath the fare box revenue threshold that the Carter administration put on Amtrak for their long distance routes. Now, this possible restoration of the National Limited sees it go well beyond just Missouri, but instead of Kansas City, it makes its way through Tulsa and Oklahoma City before heading south along the route of the current Heartland Flyer service before arriving in the DFW Metroplex, most likely to the current terminus of the Heartland Flyer in Fort Worth. This one is an intriguing one to me for a number of reasons, since it would return direct rail service to my local area around Philly to well beyond Pittsburgh and Indianapolis, but not quite the return of the Broadway Limited to Chicago that I had hoped for. Uh, maybe one day. But regardless, a direct rail link between New York City and St. Louis for the first time since the 70s is a good thing in my books, especially since the part of the run between Indianapolis and St. Louis could also serve as a basis for a ring route of the proposed Chicago hub system, which would see corridor routes run multiple times a day radiating out of Chicago to points in the Midwest, with some of them maybe even seeing proper high-speed rail upgrades. No, those don't count. Upgrade them to 125 and double track them for more than 20 feet and then we can talk. But besides the hub and spoke sort of layout that are the big things we talk about with the Midwest system, these ring routes like Indianapolis to St. Louis are vital too, and both for direct connections they offer without a lengthy diversion to Chicago to change trains, and for the smaller towns they can serve on the route. That's actually going to be something of a theme with some of the other routes by the way. As for later on in the trip, a link between St. Louis and Tulsa could possibly lead to a corridor in its own right, but the big one to me lies in Oklahoma. In my last video on this matter, I talked about the proposed extension of the Heartland Flyer, which now runs between Fort Worth and OKC, up to Wichita and Newton, Kansas. But while I like that route, it left one of the biggest low-hanging fruit routes imaginable for the state unconsidered. Oklahoma City to Tulsa, the state's two most prominent cities, and frankly probably the only cities most people outside the state have actually heard of. Of course, Oklahoma does seem rather reluctant to extend the service through their own commitments, with a lot of effort to extend the Heartland Flyer into Kansas coming mostly from groups in Newton and Wichita. But this long distance operation does offer a clever way of slowly winning them over, which I'll explain in a bit. But all told, a direct rail connection between the East and Midwest cities that are not named Chicago, and even all the way down to Texas, is definitely a compelling idea, and a very clever one in the context of things. And it's here where we get to the routes that are very much new ideas for the most part. Or at least the routes that haven't been served by a direct long distance name train in the past from what I've been able to find. To keep things organized in a sense, I'll be going from the westernmost terminus to the easternmost. So that means we'll first look at the route between San Francisco and Dallas-Fort Worth. 
It would seem that this route would follow the route of the current Amtrak San Joaquin service from the Bay Area to Bakersfield going through Merced before meeting with the Desert Wind and the Southwest Chief in Barstow. After that, it heads across the desert on the BNSF Southern Transcon line, the same tracks as the Southwest Chief, before branching off to directly serve Phoenix, which would be the first time in forever, and could make this route supplement the proposed Phoenix to Tucson corridor in the Corridor ID project, since it then serves, well, Tucson. Then it joins the route of the Sunset Limited through southern Arizona and New Mexico to El Paso, before it then branches north to Midland and Dallas-Fort Worth. Again, likely Fort Worth in my estimation. So this is an intriguing one to me since it can essentially be a gap filler for a lot of other long distance routes out west. It serves Dallas-Fort Worth like the Texas Eagle, but it makes a more direct route out to El Paso rather than going further south through Austin and San Antonio. It serves El Paso like the Sunset Limited, but the Sunset Limited doesn't go directly to Phoenix. But the big one here is the fact that the end terminus is not in LA, it's in San Francisco, opening direct rail access between the Bay Area and Texas for the first time in a long time. That, and serving as a connector to no less than four current routes, two proposed routes, and several corridor routes, both already in service and proposed in corridor ID, this can be a fine connecting service both to places immediately on the route and places beyond it, particularly in California, Texas, and arguably Oklahoma with the Heartland Flyer. Now, one question I pondered with all these routes are what the names of the trains would be. Well, I considered it for all of them, and for this one, I'm thinking either the Texas Zephyr, thus bringing back the name of a Burlington route streamliner, albeit on a different route, or the Argonaut, bringing back the name of a former Southern Pacific train, which was in actuality a secondary train to the Sunset Limited between LA and New Orleans. But given the history of the SP to the region, it could still be a good pick. A third one is one I made up on my own though, the Golden Spirit, emphasizing the train's connections into California. I'm open for ideas on all of these of course, so feel free to tell me your train name ideas in the comments down below. Overall, a solid choice and one that could be a good connector to other destinations if planned and scheduled correctly. Moving swiftly along, we come to easily one of the most unexpected and arguably the strangest of routes, not just for the two terminus cities, but the route it takes to get between them. This is the route between Phoenix, Arizona and Minneapolis, St. Paul, Minnesota. Yeah, Minnesota to Arizona. And what's even more interesting is the route it would take. Starting in Phoenix, the line would initially head northwest, away from its final destination if you weren't paying attention, before joining the route of the Southwest Chief in Flagstaff, Arizona. Then it would follow the Chief down the BNSF Southern Transcon line, which, fun fact, is upgraded to 90 mile an hour operations specifically for passenger service and fast freights, rare class 1 win there as far as Albuquerque, New Mexico, but rather than head north into Colorado, this route would continue up the Southern Transcon through Amarillo, Texas, and up through Oklahoma and Newton, Kansas, again joining the Southwest Chiefs route running to Kansas City. From there, the train heads back out of Kansas City to the northwest, again against typical convention, to Omaha, Nebraska to connect with the California Zephyr. From there, the train continues north, going to the other state that thus far has no Amtrak service, stopping in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, before heading northeast to the Twin Cities. So yeah, talk about a circuitous route and interesting city pair to link. This is easily one where it may seem like complete madness to consider such a route to be good enough to move along, but I think I can see the reasoning behind it, and how this can be one of the most clever routes on the list. Let's consider that the route passes through. Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, Nebraska, South Dakota, and Minnesota. Of those states, only Texas and Oklahoma are served by a state-sanctioned corridor route, that being the Heartland Flyer. Minnesota, to their credit, is setting up two corridor routes, they being the Twin Cities to Milwaukee and Chicago, and the much-anticipated Twin Cities to Duluth run. And of the cities that this route would serve, only two of them, the Twin Cities and Albuquerque, have commuter rail service, and each of them have only a single line. So for most of the places that this route serves, the cities either get minimal or no rail service to this date, and are in states that historically have either been apprehensive to rail investment or even outright hostile. So what makes them think that this would be met with any sort of legislative support? Well, therein lies the way Amtrak is funded. 
For the corridor routes that I discussed in the last video on this matter, since they would generally be under 750 miles, all of those routes would need to be funded at least in part by the DOTs of the states that they operate through. However, that's not the case with the long distance routes, since they're backed largely by federal funding. And in fact, Amtrak cannot create a new long distance route of their own without approval from Congress. With the impetus coming from the federal level rather than the state level, the FRA is more at liberty to present the credentials of a new route to people who could perhaps be more, more direct and receptive to the idea and have authority to grant it. Heck, even one of the senators of train-deprived South Dakota mentioned he was on board for the idea of a line connecting Sioux Falls. It may be hard to find the sort of approval at the federal level in a lot of things, but at least in these cases for routes that span multiple states, it does seem like a more favorable arrangement in some ways than an anti-rail state DOT essentially having veto power over the whole idea. The states that are most likely to invest in rail themselves are the ones that have already done so, and this is a common trend in the Amtrak Connects Us plan and the Corridor ID study. But these long distance routes could perhaps warm up more states to the idea of rail service connecting their cities again. A success story only tends to grow aspirations, and while it may be slow, it's better than eternally being nimbied away in some sense. Overall, it may sound like a crazy and circuitous route for this train, but it does have the potential to not only connect a lot of rail-deprived places, but could spawn future corridor routes. Phoenix to Flagstaff, and Kansas City, Omaha, Sioux Falls, and the Twin Cities come to mind immediately. So yeah, this is one of those routes that makes the planners either look like fools or complete geniuses, and it has more potential to be the latter than the former in my view. As for a name, hard call, but one for me that I drew up after some thought could be the Ranger, kind of given a Wild West feel akin to the likes of the Southwest Chief or the Pioneer, though one that makes sense for the Great Plains states as well. That in of itself is kind of a theme for a lot of these routes, even if a number of their termini suggest otherwise. And that's more or less the case with the next route on our list, and another one that seems like a strange choice at first glance. This is the route between Billings, Montana and El Paso, Texas. This route would start in Billings, which would be a connection point with a revived North Coast Hiawatha in this scheme, and then travel south through Wyoming to Casper and Cheyenne, which would allow it to connect with the revived Desert Wind and another long distance route to talk about later, before it continues through Colorado through Fort Collins, Denver, Colorado Springs, and Pueblo along the proposed route of the planned Front Range Corridor, before joining the route of the Southwest Chief in Trinidad, running down to Albuquerque, linking with the Chief and the aforementioned in Phoenix to Twin Cities route, before heading near dead south to El Paso to connect with the Sunset Limited and the proposed San Fran to DFW route. So if you want a lot of possible connections, this one actually looks like a good one to look at, since not only does it serve as a long distance augmentation to the Front Range Corridor from Cheyenne to Pueblo, but it connects three current and no less than seven of the proposed long distance routes with Denver seeming to be the city with the biggest traffic focus. This one in particular fascinated me for two reasons. One being that, alongside Denver, it serves a lot of cities that one may not think of as destination cities, but still need good intercity transport links regardless. I can imagine flight options from Billings to El Paso not exactly being frequent or cheap. And another reason is the route going through Wyoming. When this was being looked at, the route through Wyoming was kind of up for debate, as there were two options being floated. It seemed in this case, the route that was chosen was the westernmost option, namely BNSF's Casper subdivision through Casper, Wyoming. But regardless of which route was chosen, going through Wyoming may attract derision from Class 1 railroads in the region, namely BNSF and Union Pacific, since Wyoming's lucrative Powder River Basin coal mines are one of the biggest money makers for UP and BNSF, since they provide the overwhelming majority of the US's coal energy these days due to EPA regulations. However, as I heard Alan Fisher talk about on one of his streams, the Wyoming routes may become more attainable for passenger service than one may think, since over the years, coal traffic through the Powder River Basin has been slowly declining since the mid-2010s, with the shift to natural gas and renewables for energy. So it's his theory that perhaps with the attainment of what could be peak coal in the region, BNSF would be more open to allowing passenger services. Though the Wyoming route does present the need to see upgrades to line speed, as apparently most of the tracks on the Casper subdivision are only rated for 40 miles an hour. 
yeah, not great. And given the tendency of class ones to not care much for speeds that their infrastructure can run, unless it's a major intermodal corridor like the Southern Transcon, it would require a bit of investment, likely at the federal level, to improve line speeds and therefore trip times. Otherwise, I like the idea in principle, as a north-south line serving the Rockies is a vital connection and a unique opportunity all rolled into one. If major investment in passenger rail onto the level that is possible is being considered, routes like this would be possibly one where we would look at down the line and say, yeah, that was a forward-thinking idea that serves a lot of places that become more accessible, both by locals and outsiders alike. As for the name, I have three I'm thinking of. One of them being the Trailblazer, since it seemed fitting with the frontier culture. The Shoshone, named after a notable Native American tribe from the region, while simultaneously restoring the name of a former Burlington route train that operated between Denver and Billings on this exact same route until 1967. And the last one being the Western Star, bringing back the name of a former Great Northern Railway train, albeit not running on its former route, which was between Chicago and Seattle as a secondary train to the Empire Builder. Overall, cool idea, just need to see what it will take to upgrade the line and how much will there is to do that. Sticking in the region, we have two new routes that have Denver as one of the termini, not counting the revival of the Pioneer and the Desert Wind, which, if this whole plan works out, would make Denver a truly massive rail hub for the West again, especially if the Front Range Corridor comes to fruition. We'll start with another route that I was very interested in as soon as I saw it, and that's the route between Denver and the Twin Cities. This route would head north out of Denver to Cheyenne which going from no train service to a bunch of train services gives Cheyenne a lot of love, before heading east out to the western panhandle of Nebraska, before heading north into South Dakota, winding its way via Rapid City to the state capital of Pierre in the middle of the state, before continuing east to the largest city in the state, Sioux Falls, before heading northeast following the route of the aforementioned Phoenix to Twin Cities line into Minneapolis-St. Paul. There are several reasons why this one is interesting to me, though the biggest one is rather obvious. Proper rail service through South Dakota, with this route servicing three of the state's major cities, Rapid City, Pierre, and Sioux Falls. If that doesn't make a route that could spawn a good state corridor, I don't know what is, especially to augment the likely night-heavy service that it could run, since the distance between Denver and the Twin Cities seems like one of those perfect lengths for an overnight service, where one can get on in the evening, have dinner, relax, go to bed, have breakfast, and arrive at the other end station. Run a daytime service to complement it? It's all the better. And for those who worry about how the historically disinterested government of South Dakota seems on the matter, well, for one, that's less of an issue in the short term, since being a long distance route it requires federal backing above all else, and it seems that one of the supporters of the idea is John Thune, a South Dakota senator and the current Senate Minority Whip, who seems pretty enthusiastic about the idea of South Dakota getting Amtrak service in this plan. A good early sign for sure, and I hope it can stick, because I always like cities that used to have rail service getting it again. The potential it has is quite fascinating on several levels, being a corridor backbone for a state that's lacked rail service for decades, being a route that can fall into the Goldilocks zone for long distance rail travel, though that's definitely predicated on track upgrades since I've seen places with 40 mile an hour track speed limits and even as low as 25 miles an hour. Yeah, I'm not kidding. And connecting two major urban centers of Denver and the Twin Cities with each other almost directly. This one would be a win on a lot of levels. As for names to give it, ideas I have include the Lakota Flyer, named after the famous Native American tribe who lived in the region, the Mount Rushmore Express, guess why, or the Black Hills Limited, named for the famous mountain range to the west of South Dakota that the route passes near which Mount Rushmore is actually in. Overall, it's great that such an under-discussed place like the Dakotas, Wyoming, and Montana are on the docket for consideration here, which really goes to show the hidden potential that these places have in terms of passenger rail and public transport in general, and this route could make that potential manifest itself. I definitely have high hopes for this one. Just please, oh please, let it come with track upgrades. Going back to Denver again, we head from Mile High to the south this time, with the route between Denver and Houston. 
Following the aforementioned Billings to El Paso run and the Front Range Corridor again, the route runs down to Trinidad, branching to the southeast to Amarillo, Texas, where it connects with the Phoenix to Twin Cities line. Continuing southeast, it would stop in Dallas-Fort Worth before following the path of what will hopefully be the Texas Central High Speed Line, the proposed Amtrak DFW to Houston corridor, and I-35 before reaching Houston. Yet again, two major cities are finally being reunited by rail and connecting a lot of places that people want to go to and places that have been underserved by rail for decades. Most notably, Amarillo, Texas, which is a textbook railroad town where the route meets with the Southern Transcon. And yet again, it seems like one of those routes where, with track upgrades between Amarillo and DFW in particular, it can be one of those routes that has the potential to be one of them and for the business traveler going between Denver, Dallas-Fort Worth, and Houston, with the late night departure and morning arrival. It may take time to reach that point due to the vast empty distances, but with track upgrades and possibly new equipment, that could be very well possible. And here though, I think it's a good chance to talk about future long distance equipment that could run these services. Amtrak's current fleet for long distance trains are essentially two fleets that work in separate parts of the country and can be broadly divided along two lines. The routes that run into New York City and the routes that don't. The ones that do use exclusively single deck trains with consists made up of mixes of Amfleet 2 coach cars and Viewliner 1 and 2 sleeper, dining, and baggage cars. The Amfleet 2s, just like the Amfleet 1s that are the current mainstay of corridor routes in most places, will likely be retired in the coming years by the new Siemens Venture cars, similar to the ones that will be used on the upcoming Amtrak Aero sets, along with the Amtrak Midwests and San Joaquins and even Brightline's current trains. The Viewliners still have plenty of life in them, with the oldest ones dating back to the 90s and the newest Viewliner 2s arriving in 2018. For the rest of those routes though, most of them use the now iconic Amtrak Superliner bi-level cars. The first of the Superliners were built in the 1970s and have had several upgrades to keep them in long distance service, with a second batch of them delivered in the 90s. These cars have become one of the greatest symbols of Amtrak across the country, alongside the F40PHs, the AEM7s, the Amfleets, and the Acela Express. And it was always going to be interesting to see what would be replaced with down the line. For a while, debate raced as to whether Amtrak would want the next generation of long-distance trains to be single-deckers only, allowing for a wider spread use across the network, or going with double-deckers again. One thing was for sure though, which was that like the Aerosets and the Acelas, Amtrak was looking to make the next long distance trains be semi-permanently coupled train sets rather than just individual cars coupled together. One of the main reasons for this could stem from predictability of each train, as well as improving accessibility for disabled passengers, both of which are certainly good things. However, a concern that has been raised among enthusiasts is that unless there's a robust maintenance contract with the builder, one car having an issue could effectively cancel an entire train with this setup. However, as semi-permanently coupled overnight trains are becoming mainstays across the world, the OBB night jets for the Austrian railways are a great example of this, it is certainly possible that the trains can present a better rider experience, and also being permanently coupled means that the coaches are less susceptible to electrical and mechanical defects in general, since the trains are not constantly chopped and changed between trips. And even then, if capacity demands it, more cars can still be added regardless. For a while, two basic ideas for train sets were considered. A 10-car single-deck train set and a 9-car double-decker train set. According to the preliminary concept for both ideas, the single-decker train would consist of a coach car, two handicapped accessible coach cars, an accessible park coach park cafe car, an accessible dining car, mostly consisting of the galley and a few booths for seats, a main dining car slash lounge car, basically combining the single dining car and single lounge observation car into one car, which I'm curious as to how that would work. An accessible sleeping car, mostly consisting of accessible rooms and a standard room. A roomette sleeping car, which consists of the smallest room options available on the train. Another sleeping car consisting of regular and family rooms. And a utility car for the cruise quarters and luggage storage. For the double-deckers, it becomes more akin to the stuff we're used to seeing, albeit with some improvements. You have two coach cars with seating on both floors, both of which with accessibility features, including wheelchair lifts between the floors, an accessible coach cafe car mix, 
the classic dining car with the first floor fully occupied by the kitchen and the upper floor for dining booths, a lounge car following in the footsteps of the legendary sightseers lounges on the current superliners, an accessible sleeping car with accessible and standard rooms on both floors, a standard bedroom sleeper with larger rooms, a roomette sleeper with smaller rooms, and a utility car with cruise quarters and one or two passenger roomettes on the upper deck and luggage space on the lower deck. While the double deck option had a bigger show of support among enthusiasts for multiple reasons, from improved capacity to retaining the classic dining and lounge features that the Superliners have, the main downside is that it's still unlikely that these cars will be able to operate in New York's Penn Station, since while the overhead electric catenary on the Northeast Corridor can be cleared by the Superliners easily in most places, the main problem is clearance issues in the Hudson River tunnels. There are certainly double-decker cars that can enter those tunnels, take New Jersey Transit's bi-level cars for example, but they are lower in height and accessing the platforms in Penn Station will require a middle level to access the high-level platforms, which Amtrak doesn't have in their concepts and would have their own share of issues. As such, at the cost of not being able to run on routes out of New York City, such as the Crescent, the Silver Meteor, the Lakeshore Limited, and the proposed route from New York City to Dallas-Fort Worth I talked about earlier, Amtrak seems to be considering higher double-decker trains as their new long-distance fleet. Definitely check out this video by Christian Leonard if you're interested in this conundrum a bit more. From the way discussion seems to be going, Amtrak seems to be more interested in bi-level options as opposed to single-level cars, which is great for me because I love those sightseers' lounges and I would hate to see them go. Nothing has been made official to the public just yet about the design choice, let alone a potential manufacturer, but it is good to see that there is serious consideration being made for the future of long-distance operations, since with the primary focus of new route searches understandably being intercity corridor routes that don't require sleeping accommodation, for the most part, it would be easy to understand if Amtrak just left its long-distance fleet set in stone for a while while the new corridor trains arrive on the scene. However, that doesn't seem to be the case. They're hitting the ground running. Though, one thing I haven't seen as of yet has to do with the roomette sleepers. And that is if all of them will be the traditional roomettes for two people, or if Amtrak takes into account a kind of sleeping accommodation being used in Europe, the sleeper pod. Right now, the smallest room available on Amtrak long distance trains is the roomette, which is designed for two people. However, there is most certainly demand for single passengers wanting to get a sleeping accommodation that isn't just a coach seat, even though Amtrak long distance coach seats are really comfortable as seats go. Meanwhile, European sleeping train operators can also equip their trains with these sleeping pods, which work similarly to those capsule hotels in Japan. You still have your own windows, lights, air conditioning, charging ports, and storage for your belongings. Some even mount a small TV screen in the pods. But the layout can fit a lot more passengers wishing to get a bed for their trip and can likely make those accommodations cheaper than booking a roomette. Which given the relatively limited number of roomettes per train by comparison makes roomettes pretty expensive. I mean, god damn that's a lot. Sure, you get free meals and fantastic food on the trip, but it's still a lot. Overall, I hope Amtrak takes that idea into consideration, as it's easily an interesting opportunity to increase supply and induce demand for sleeping services on their trains going forward. And it's here I realized just how big a tangent I went on here. Where was I? Oh yeah, Denver to Houston. On the whole, this one's a really good route option, linking three major cities and serving as a great opportunity for a route that can serve business travelers as well as tourists. Add to the fact that it can augment corridors like Texas Central, though I doubt we'd see it ever run over the prospective future Texas Central high-speed line, and this one's a favorite for me. As for a name, one I immediately thought of is the Sam Houston Zephyr, which was actually the name of a former Burlington Route Streamliner, and another I could see being the Lone Star Limited because, well, Texas. Great idea, and one I see being one of the biggest ones to push for as well, since it's kind of an obvious idea in hindsight. Okay now, let's get back on track here, sorry not sorry, and we'll look at our next route, and we'll stick in Texas for a little bit more with this one, which is San Antonio to the Twin Cities. From San Antonio, the route follows the line of the Texas Eagle through Austin and up to Dallas-Fort Worth, which is really becoming a hub for Texas in this vision. The route then continues up to Tulsa, Oklahoma, not passing through OKC though, and using different tracks in the Heartland Flyer, but still making a connection with the proposed New York City to DFW route. 
From Tulsa, the route continues almost straight north to Kansas City, linking with the Southwest Chief, the Missouri River Runner, and the Phoenix to Twin Cities route, before continuing north through Iowa to the state capital of Des Moines, where it connects with the California Zephyr, then heading north through Iowa's cornfields to Minneapolis-St. Paul. This is another one of those north-south routes that are frankly pretty under-considered, but can be fantastic, and in this case, has even bigger potential ridership markets than the previous one between Billings and El Paso, passing through several major cities of the Midwest. And oh boy, can we talk about the corridor route opportunities here. DFW to San Antonio, DFW to Tulsa, creating a triangle of routes between Oklahoma and North Texas, Tulsa to Kansas City, Kansas City to Des Moines, Des Moines to the Twin Cities. If this route isn't an example of fantastic potential, I don't know what does. Imagine if this service was the major north-south route being augmented by corridor routes raiding out of the Twin Cities, Kansas City, and Dallas-Fort Worth. That would be a true rebirth of rail transport options in the Midwest, probably similar in some ways that the Chicago hub network could be. Instant win in my book, I love it. As for a name, I have two that I lean towards, both tapping into legacies of railroads long past. One of them would be the Great Plains Rocket, carrying on a legacy of the Rock Island Railroad that used to serve this region pretty extensively, and the other being the Firefly, which was the name of a former Frisco Line overnight streamliner between Tulsa and Kansas City. This one though I'm definitely grasping for more things that could be unique and fitting, so again, as with all these, leave your own name ideas down below. So we stay yet again in Texas for the next few, with two routes radiating out of Dallas-Fort Worth, and the first is DFW to Atlanta. Now, this route was actually looked at as well as part of Corridor ID, though only as far as the part along the Shreveport racetrack between DFW to Meridian, Mississippi through Shreveport, Louisiana, and Jackson. But while that one was being studied as a day train corridor route, this one continues further, joining the route of the Crescent at Meridian, heading to Birmingham, Alabama, before arriving in Atlanta, one of the currently most criminally underserved cities by rail, even though it was founded as a railroad town. Hell, even Atlanta itself was actually named for the railroad that founded it, the Western and Atlantic Railroad. And for another long distance route to connect to places far afield, this is definitely one of the better ones to look at too. Not only would Atlanta serve as a connection to proposed corridor ID routes to Chattanooga, Nashville, Memphis, and Savannah, but even possible high speed connections to Charlotte and being an end terminus for what could be the Southeast Corridor in the coming years and decades. This route would only add to that by connecting the Southeast with Texas by rail for the first time in decades, and I can't help but support that. Add to this connections to Birmingham and Jackson, Mississippi, and a possible corridor service between DFW and Meridian through Shreveport, and you have one of the most fleshed out ideas for a long distance service out there. I expressed in my last video a degree of skepticism regarding funding for the corridor route, but since these routes are not nearly as reliant on state support as the corridor routes, this seems like a good way to ease the Mississippi, Louisiana, and Texas governments into the idea of supporting a corridor service along this stretch. Also, yes, this seems like another route that would fall into a Goldilocks zone for business travel on an overnight train if one's going between DFW and Atlanta, so that only adds to the bonus points. As for a name, this one was tricky for me to pick, but if I were to, I'd probably pick between two names hearkening back to the days of the Southern Railway, they being the Peach Queen, as the route would serve Georgia, the Peach State, and the Golden Rod, largely because the name sounds really cool. This one I'm definitely open for suggestions for, since it was hard to pick one and I truly liked. So again, let me know your ideas. And here we move on to the other route running out of Dallas-Fort Worth, and that's DFW to Miami. Again, another pretty good no-brainer idea. This one would run out of Dallas and run through Marshall, Texas before heading to New Orleans, where connections could be made with the Sunset Limited to LA, the Crescent to New York, and the city of New Orleans to Chicago, alongside a new intercity corridor to Mobile, Alabama coming soon, and a possible route to Baton Rouge, where this route goes through to head to the Big Easy. From there, the route goes along the tracks of the future New Orleans to Mobile run through Pascagoula and Biloxi, Mississippi, before crossing into the Florida Panhandle, going through Pensacola and Tallahassee on the route that the Sunset Limited used to take until 2005 after Hurricane Katrina. The route then continues east to Jacksonville before heading south along the Atlantic coast down to Miami. 
Texas to Florida definitely seems like a pretty obvious market to consider as well, especially since it directly connected Dallas with New Orleans in the process and reopens rail service to Pensacola and Tallahassee for the first time in 20 years to this point. And it's here where the main concern as to this idea comes into play. Not so much in the route, so much as who owns it. After 2005, the part of the line between Pensacola and Tallahassee has come under the control of a Class 3 railroad called the Florida Gulf and Atlantic Railroad, who purchased the route off of CSX after it was damaged by Hurricane Katrina. Even as apprehensive as railroads, and especially smaller railroads are about allowing Amtrak to operate on their lines, FG&A have been particularly apprehensive on the matter. So I imagine that despite the incredible potential that this line has, it's going to require quite a bit of convincing to allow FG&A to allow this, since it runs on the only surviving main line through the Florida Panhandle. While this is still a proposal, I can imagine that the FRA and Amtrak has a plan cooked up to convince them to let them use the route, since to me, this is an obvious slam dunk. That and a route that could encourage a corridor route between DFW and New Orleans sounds like a win in my book. As for a name, an obvious pick to me would be the Gulf Coast Limited, reviving the name of a former Amtrak service between New Orleans and Mobile, since I do like the working title of Mardi Gras for the corridor route they have now. For me, it'd be either that or the Gulf Breeze, another former Amtrak service that ran in the region, and the Gulf Wind, a former Louisville and Nashville train that ran between Mobile and Jacksonville on the proposed route. All told, Texas to Florida would be great, just need to convince a pretty annoying obstacle to accept progress here. I imagine that convincing them could come in the form of track upgrades, so that could be a win for all. I hope. And now we have the last route with the terminus in Texas, with a curious one and that being Houston, Texas to New York City. From Houston, the route would travel along the Texas Gulf Coast to New Orleans on the route of the Sunset Limited. After connecting with the city of New Orleans in Crescent and the aforementioned DFW to Miami route in the Big Easy, and another route that I'll discuss next, the line follows a more southerly route than the Crescent, running through Mobile and Montgomery, Alabama, before heading to Atlanta to link up with the Crescent, the Atlanta to DFW route, and the revived Floridian route branching off to the north. As the Crescent goes east to Charlotte, this route goes north to Chattanooga, Tennessee, before promptly diverting east across the Great Smoky Mountains to Roanoke, Virginia, where it joins the Crescent's route again, as well as the Roanoke branch of the Northeast Regional Service to Washington, D.C. After a switch from diesel to electric power at Union Station, the train continues along the Northeast Corridor through Baltimore, Philadelphia, and Newark before reaching New York Penn Station. So, this one can be confusing to some, and frankly, I myself am wondering a few things about it. In a lot of ways, this could be accused of simply being the Crescent, but extended to Houston and taking a diversion away from the big ridership generators of Charlotte to serve Chattanooga and Knoxville and rural eastern Tennessee. Though I would argue that one benefit from a touristy ridership standpoint is that a trip through the Great Smoky Mountains is a great choice for views, possibly up there with the likes of the Cardinal in West Virginia. The other obvious benefit here is that it would be a route serving Montgomery, Alabama and connecting it to Mobile, a possible starting point for a proper corridor service in Alabama from Mobile to Montgomery to Birmingham, something I'll talk about in the next one too. But I can see a fair amount of skepticism, particularly in the current state of affairs in the region if this is the best option. In a way though, I see it being somewhat similar to what Amtrak currently has with the Silver Star and the Silver Meteor. Both of those routes serve the New York City to Miami run, but the Silver Star stops in Raleigh, North Carolina and Columbia, South Carolina further inland, and the Silver Meteor would run through Fayetteville, North Carolina and Charleston, South Carolina before following the same route when they meet up in Savannah, Georgia. Of the two, the Silver Star tends to get more ridership due to its stop in Raleigh, but there is still definitely an argument to keep the Silver Meteor in its place. I do wonder about this one though, since the difference between the ridership point and potential could be quite substantial, with it skipping out on a big traffic generator in Charlotte, with the main benefit being an extension to Houston, which I could argue that the Crescent could be extended there too just as well. Don't get me wrong, Chattanooga, Knoxville, and Eastern Tennessee would stand to benefit from this service as every line would have. But I do wonder how far this idea could go, even if it presents an idea on the table for a corridor route between Houston and New Orleans, and the aforementioned Alabama corridor, both of which I really like to see. I'd love for my skepticism to be unfounded on this one, particularly for the Tennessee bit, 
but for the moment, I have several question marks regarding this idea. As for the name, given the seeming supplementary nature of this route for the Crescent, I'm going to pick the names of other named trains from the Southern Railway for my two ideas. They being the Southerner and the Pelican, both of which were trains that supplemented the Crescent Limited historically. This one I may not be completely sold on at the moment, but I want to be talked into it here. So if there's any insight into what's being considered in this case, do let me know. And finally, we come to the last one on the list, which is a much more positive one from my perspective, and that's New Orleans to Detroit. From New Orleans, the route follows the Houston to New York run through Mobile and Montgomery before branching off north to go to Birmingham, thus completing a possible aforementioned Alabama corridor. From there, the route goes near due north all the way to Nashville, from where it will parallel the revived Floridian route as far as Louisville, Kentucky. From there, the route branches away to the northeast to serve Cincinnati, Ohio, and inevitably its incredibly beautiful but underserved train station. I mean, just look at this thing. And from there, it runs on the route of the proposed National Limited Revival and the proposed Cincinnati-Columbus-Cleveland Corridor as far as Columbus, from which it branches north to Toledo, where it meets with the Lakeshore Limited and eventually up to Detroit. This one definitely seems to cover a lot of the gaps left over in other routes, all the while serving another north-south route serving major cities on a popular route for tourists and business travel alike. With major centers like New Orleans, Nashville, Detroit, Cincinnati, Louisville, and Birmingham neatly lined up on the route, I think this one could be pretty popular and could be a gateway to the creation of supplemental corridors aplenty. Mobile to Montgomery to Birmingham, Nashville to Louisville, Louisville to Cincinnati, and two of them planned at this point with Cincinnati to Columbus to Cleveland and Cleveland to Toledo to Detroit. A lot of ridership generators and a lot of connections make this pretty convincing to me. Add to the fact that it goes to a lot of states that, while not showing as much interest in rail service in the past, have really started to show it lately, with Ohio, Michigan, and Tennessee starting to show interest in Amtrak routes, as I described in my Corridor ID program, along with being a route that can get Alabama firmly on board for future rail service revivals, this one seems fantastic to me. And for a name to give this enticing service, I have three in mind all derived from the names of former trains of the Louisville and Nashville Railroad that ran the majority of this route. They being the South Wind, the Pan American, and the Hummingbird, all of which ran parts of the route from New Orleans to Cincinnati. This is very definitely one of those routes I have high hopes for too, since not only does it cover a major north-south link, but it provides services and connections to a lot of places that wouldn't have had it before. The fact that it provides potential groundwork for future state corridors like Mobile to Birmingham and Cincinnati to Louisville is a great long-term gravy for me. And the same can be said for a lot of these routes, even if I question how well some of them will stand the test of time compared to others. Looking at the routes we have on the table, there's a lot to like here, but plenty of questions going forward. With the Corridor ID project, that project is covering a lot of obvious gaps in the network connecting places within the Goldilocks zone of intercity rail travel, and providing connections between major centers and others within a day trip of each other. With this project, this is tackling a more contentious issue, that being overnight services and multi-day trips. As said at the top of the video, these kinds of routes tend to be polarizing for rail advocates and fans since historically the long distance routes have been the obvious elephant in the room as to why Amtrak has been a loss making entity throughout its entire existence. However, I would argue that those that bemoan such a state of affairs, particularly since Amtrak was apparently supposed to be turning profits within just a few years of its creation, which looking at it with 2020 hindsight was kind of a foolish idea in the first place, it kind of misses one of the key points behind Amtrak as an entity. Amtrak was created because railroads were losing money on passenger trains and were desperate to shed their services. But at the same time, a case was still out there for rail services between major cities and towns and on cross-country routes as service to rural communities were still important to people and, crucially, to politicians and constituents. As such, while politicians often bemoan the loss making long distance routes, those same politicians will also be committing an affront to their own constituents if they do cut these services, hence why they stick around with federal and state support. 
That being said, there is a reason as to why these long distance routes could be profitable, if only marginal in most cases. If new equipment can allow for higher passenger capacity, particularly for sleeping car passengers, such as the aforementioned sleeper pods, thus lowering prices and facilitating an induction in demand, as well as finding the equipment to offer more than one running of a train per day, thus allowing for services to many places that take place at reasonable hours. I mean, not many people are particularly keen on catching a plane in the dead of night, and that's also true with a train. Finding a way to run these trains at a 12 hour frequency rather than 24 hours or worse can increase capacity on services, again, inducing demand and lowering prices. You see the pattern here? You make it a more equitable and appealing service by running more trains with higher capacity, thus reducing prices. Add in some track upgrades, such as what was done to the Southern Transcon to allow the Southwest Chief and fast freights to run at 90 miles an hour through New Mexico and Arizona's deserts, and that only makes it more enticing. This is to say nothing of the fact that a fair amount of these routes could have a more overarching meta purpose, and that is to serve as a proof of concept for future intercity rail corridor services, which the long distance trains could easily supplement. The majority of these routes would run through states where leadership has either never considered subsidizing rail service or have rejected the idea in the past. However, with these routes being paid for by funding at the federal level rather than the state level, this could be a way to make constituents and politicians alike consider the positive effect that a more frequent rail service could have on their cities, towns, and people. As someone living in the Northeast, the region would be far worse off without our rail services. And sometimes all it takes is a case to be presented as to what rail can bring to the table, and you get more people on board rather than just the diehard train nuts and advocates. Overall, I have high hopes for this long distance study, though I can see it having more obstacles in some sense than Corridor ID. However, with rail advocacy becoming stronger and stronger by the day as more people recognize it as a solution to a lot of problems in our transportation system, there is little reason to see at least a few of these routes seeing the light of day. Perhaps one day in the not too distant future, I can enjoy a long distance trip to places I never expected to see connected with each other before this came out. And perhaps more rail services can join it too. Even those not run by Amtrak, as private entities have been proposing long distance services of their own. Perhaps this can be the beginning of a true revival of long distance trains, once a legendary mainstay of American transportation, and a starting point for a notable shift for people, from both small town and big city alike, and in how they get around.